So back at it, uh, we're gonna we're gonna kind of not really switch gears, but we're gonna take this and, and we're gonna we're gonna change 2D to 3D, and we're gonna see how that relates. And you're gonna like it because a lot of what you do in 2D has this little just a little, little extension in 3D, and it's it's not really any any different. Uh, it's just that you have this this third dimension. Now, if you didn't know this, <clears throat> a lot of our world sort of like takes place in 3D. Did you know that? That's crazy. I know, right? Well, which means that one plane really doesn't cut it. It would cut it if we were always just on a flat road driving a car. That would probably work for cars. But we have like planes, right? And we move and we have particles that, that move about. We need to be able to describe them in three space, in 3D, uh, in R3, what we call this stuff. So we need a new coordinate system. And, and here's how we do it. Please get this right. Uh, it's not hard, okay? But it's, it's a little... It's a little different. What we're going to do is, instead of just having our XY plane, we're still going to have that. But what we're going to do is, instead of having our XY plane up here, we're going to we're going to drop it. So our our plane falls down horizontal. Now we get this this different axis. So X Y Z. seems logical. Let's put them in alphabetical order. And then we get this Z axis going perpendicular to both the X and the Y. So X and Y are perpendicular, Z is also, they're mutually perpendicular. That's a 3D coordinate system. So when you're drawing it, you still draw this, but please, please, it's not X and Y anymore. This is not X and Y. The X is a little weird. The X is the one that comes out towards you. So the X is the one that does this. This right here is the x-axis. This right here is the y-axis and it has to be the y. It's it's laying flat and if you look down it creates the xy plane for you like it like it normally does. Do you guys see what I'm talking about? It's the z that shoots up. Please, please always write the three the three uh, three plane coordinate system like this. Please do that. Now we're going to identify a whole lot about this before we can move any further. The first one is where are our positive numbers and where are our negative numbers. So here, here's where they are. The positive numbers for x are coming this way. So this is the positive x and this would be the negative x. So here's like 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and negative 4. The y, where do you suppose the, the positive y is, to the right or to the left? Yeah, we don't want to switch everything around. The positive is, is to the right on, on the y-axis. So 1, 2, 3, 4. This is positive y. And negative y is over here. And the z, the same concept. Positive z is going to climb, negative z is going to fall. <laughs> Quick head and I feel okay with that one so far. It's a little funky, right? But, I mean, it's not 2D anymore, so we have to have a, a way to represent three dimensions. This is the best we got. So, this, by the way, is called the right-hand coordinate system. Here's, here's why it's called the right hand. If I put my... If I put my hand out where my fingers are going along the positive x, and if I curl them towards the positive y, my thumb is pointed up towards the positive z. Do you see what I'm talking about? If I, flip, I can't, if I put it this hard and hurt my shoulder, but put it like that, I, I go positive x to negative y, well, that's, that's pointed negative. Z. Does that make sense to you? That's what's called right-handed. So positive x to positive y gives me positive z. X to negative y gives me negative z. That's what, and that's the notes your right hand. Left-handed would be when I went positive x to positive y, it would give me, it'd be the other way. The y would be shifted, and that would give me this. We're talking about right-handed three-quarter system. This is generally what people do. So do you feel comfortable about the uh, positive and negative axes? Yeah or no? Yes. Could you... Could you identify the xy plane? Could you could you show me with like your hands, like how it goes? Where, where, is it is it going? Is it on the board? Is this the xy plane? No. How's the xy plane? 
Right. Yeah, that's right. It's this flat one that's kind of cutting into the board. How about the um, the YZ plane? What's the YZ plane? Is the YZ plane cutting into the board, or is the YZ plane on the board? The YZ plane is the board. The XZ plane is the one that's going into the board this way. And not if you're okay with the, the planes. All right, fantastic. Now points. Points can't be. X and Y anymore. So hey, uh, plot the point two, three. You're gonna go, wait a minute, two, three, where's, okay, two, two would be X and three would be, y. where's that gonna be though? Because I, I need that third thing now. R2, so like 2D, we just need two points. R3, you, you now need three, you need three values, three coordinates. So we now have X, Y, and Z, it's always alphabetical order. I gotta be honest with you, so they're ordered triples, not, not ordered pairs. Um, they're, they're not the easiest thing in the world to, to plot here. Uh, they really aren't because it's weird to go outside of a plane. You know what I'm talking about? But you don't yet, but you will, you will. It's weird to go outside of a plane. So we're gonna try just a, a couple so you get the idea on it. I'm also gonna talk to you about something called, well not quadrants, how many, how many sections are there? If I used my planes, how many sections would I have? There was four quadrants because I went one, Eight. two, three, and four, correct? Yeah. Now each of those quadrants has a, a top and a bottom. Eight. Four quadrants, each of them has a top and a bottom. Eight. Eight, Eight octants. One, all positive. Two, three, and four, so it models the quadrant system. One, two, three, four, and then we drop down five, six, seven, and eight. So above quadrant one, we have octant one, and below it we have octant five. Does that make sense to you? And we go around like that. So let's try to plot just a couple of them. The first one, I want to plot kind of an easy one. Let's do two, zero, negative three. Okay, everybody, quickly, really quickly, what is the x coordinate, please? Two. What is the y coordinate? Zero. What's the z coordinate? Negative three. Here's how you do it. It's always that order. So from the origin, we have positive 2, that's here, notice it's here, y is 0, so we don't go anywhere, and then we drop down how much? Okay, now it's a little weird, here's the best way that you can plot these things. It's going to take some parallel lines, here's how to, here's how to draw it. For those of you who aren't artistic, I'm not either, uh, but if you got like a ruler and can make parallel lines, this is the best way. Okay, check, check this out. So here's the, the two. I'm going to put like just a little temporary mark. Here's the, the zero. I'm not moving. Here's the negative three on the z-axis. You, you follow what I'm talking about? From this point, you're going to do two things. You're going to draw parallel with the z-axis this way and parallel with the x-axis this way. And where they meet, that is where your point is. Watch. So I'm going to draw parallel. That looks pretty close to parallel for me on the x x axis. Does that make sense to you? It goes through the z coordinate, and then this I'm going to draw parallel to the z axis. The intersection of those, that right there, is the point two zero negative three. It's floating in space. It is on the XZ plane because the Y coordinate is settled. So it's right there on that plane. And not if you're okay with that one. You see what I'm talking about? They're a little weird to graph, right? It's going to take practice, and there's no other way that I can tell you, but, but it's going to take practice. It's going to take <coughs> practice. Let me do one more with you. And after that, it really is just all about practice, okay? Uh, Let's do, how about two, three, five? Two, three, four. Quickly, x coordinate, please. Y coordinate? Z coordinate. What octant will this be in? I go out, right? I go out on the on the x because it's positive. Then I go here, and then I go. That's it. That's that's floating. 
that's floating up here. That's like right here. Okay, so, so we're we're in octet number. That's where we're at. Let's try to graph it. So when you when you have these, do the x and the y first. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our parallel lines for. I'm trying to show this to you that way when you can actually visualize these points. Here's how it works. Uh, draw your parallel axes again. So from my two and from my three, I'm going to draw parallel along the y. Uh, this is the hard one. It's the x-axis. Draw parallel. So it's like this. Draw parallel along the x. Do you see what I'm what I'm doing? Parallel along the x and parallel along the y. I know if you see what, what we're talking about. Hello, yes, no. Okay, true or false? The point is right there. True or false? false. No, false, yeah. This is the what we call a projection. If you were to look down upon the world and the xy plane is flat, the point it's raised up here, but it would look like it's right over that spot on the XY plane. Does that make sense to you? Like a bird's eye view, that's where it would show up. That would be the shadow, or the image, or the projection. That's what's happening. Now, where is this point really, though? Where, where is this point? Is it up, or is it down? How much is it up? Four. Ah. So, from right here, you can do this two ways. You can just take this amount and go straight up parallel. That's typically how I would probably do it, but you lose a little bit of measurement that way. So I go, okay, my hand's pretty big, so there, there, right about there. That's where that is. But there, there's a slightly different way to do it. I'm going to show you that way as well. The other way that you do this is you just, because if you, if you don't know, if you don't know where it's at, you extend this up as far as you can, and you, you do this. This is a weirder way, but it's a little more accurate. Draw yourself that segment that intersects the origin with the projection of your point. Are you, are you following what I'm talking about? I'm going to make it dotted here. Go up to the appropriate height. Oh, what's the appropriate height? What's our Z here? Appropriate height. Oh. Here, shift this up. In other words, make it parallel. And where that intersects, that's where your point is in space. It gives you a decent visual representation about where you can. You guys see the three D representation I'm trying to draw here? So it's. It's not exactly down here, it's shifted up, but that gives you a good frame, like, oh, th this is weird, because it's on the plane, right? But I gotta show that it's not. So I show my parallel lines, and that's a good way to do it. That's a, man, I, they take a while, right? It's gonna take just practice for you to, for you to do this. Head not if you're okay with at least one of those ways of graphing these. Okay, perfect. What about this? What if I said I want you to graph x equals two? Could you do it? What is x equals 2? Line. Lines would be in 2D. What's a line in 3D? What's a line that goes forever in it's a plane? If we have x equals 2, lines now become planes. Circles become spheres. Okay, Functions become surfaces. So we're extending the, the dimension. So when I say x equals 2, that x equals 2 says x equals 2 for everything. That's a plane. So the x equals 2 would cut through the x-axis uh, at 2 and go all the way this way. How about y? y equals 5. If I did y equals 5, what that would do is we'd come over here to 5, we'd cut into the board at 5. It wouldn't be like this, it wouldn't be like this because that would intersect. It would just be just, just like that. X and Y, or sorry, X and Z could be anything. It would cut right through Y equals 5. Does that make sense? Can you visualize Z equals negative 2? What plane would Z equals negative 2 be parallel to? Perfect, X, Y plane. It'd be like taking the X, Y plane and dropping it two spots. That's what Z equals negative 2 
are you still with me? Am I boring you to tears? I hope I'm not. It's not super difficult, but it's super new, which can be difficult. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about before we take just a, a short break, um, when we get an equation now, and when our equation is in X's and Y's, in 2D, we got, we got lines and stuff, right? And functions. But when we get X's and Y's and Z's now, we now have the ability to shift through space in the X direction and the Y direction and the Z. We don't get lines necessarily. We can, but we don't get planes necessarily. We can. We get these things called surfaces. We get weird stuff, and it's pretty cool. And that's really the focus of this class, is how we deal with the calculus uh, of surfaces and things that are on surfaces and traveling through surfaces, stuff like that. That's the majority of it. And then we talk about you know, vector fields, and that's, that's later on. But let's go ahead and we'll take a break, and then we'll, we'll come back and, and fill out this stuff. All right, time to change our 2D stuff into 3D stuff. Uh, we're going to start here. You're going to find out that all the formulas that we use for 3D coordinates are based on 2D coordinates. They're, they're very, very, very similar. They just add the third component. So, so, for instance, our distance formula. If you wanted to find the distance between two points and you had a 2D system, this is the distance formula for 2D, x2 minus x1 squared, y2 minus y1 squared. That's how we found magnitude. Um, if we want the third, it's literally just adding on the z2 minus z1 squared. That, that's all there is to it, w which means this. Now think about this, kind of think of the future. When, when we do vectors, notice how the magnitude, if the distance formula is basically the same for 2D and 3D, then the magnitude is basically the same for 2D and 3D. And that's really, really nice. Does that make sense to you? So we're going to get that from here. Um, now, it's so just a, a little short example. Do you know what an isosceles triangle is? Do you know what that means? Uh, triangle that has one eye. Has, has two, <laughs> two sides that are exactly the same. So if I wanted two sides that had the same length and I had three points, well, I could find the distance between every set of two points and check those distances. So the idea behind doing problems like this is try, try to think back to the geometric aspect of it. And, and do the do distance formula, do the midpoint formula, do what it takes to, to compare these, these sides or something. So if we found the distance from A to B, the distance from B to C, and the distance from A to C, that would represent the three sides of our triangle. Can you guys do that? Could you find the distance between A and B, and, and A and C, and B and C? Could you do that? Let's try it. Let's try it real quick. Uh, I'll do the first one for you. Uh, just to show you how, how fast this really really goes, but the idea is you should be able to use the formulas. Uh, then, then if I ask you for something like, oh, hey, is it a right triangle? Well, if you can find the distances and they fit the Pythagorean theorem, then you'd have a right triangle. Does that, does that make sense? Were you listening? I'll say it again later then, okay? You're probably working. So the way it works, just take uh, the x2 minus x1 squared, x, y2 minus y1 squared, z2 minus z1 squared. So from a to b, we have 1 squared plus 0 squared plus 5 squared. This is going to give you the square root of 26. Can you verify that for me? The square root of 26. Yes. Do you see where the numbers came from? Yes. I don't want to blow past you. I don't want to go too fast for you. Are you, are you seriously with me? Yes. Okay. How about the BC? What's the first number I would square? One. Do we have to do negative one when we're squaring stuff? Because if I went BC, it'd really be three minus four. Does it matter? I could go CB. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. So if I want to do here to here, that's that's fine too. That's probably a little bit easier. Even. So we'd have one squared plus three squared plus what's the next one? Sixteen, nine, one. How much? True or false? It's at least isosceles. Yes. Absolutely. Why? Because I have two sides that are the same, so it fits isosceles. The third side, uh, I think we can square root of ten, but we can we can do it. AC is zero squared plus three squared uh, plus negative one squared, but you just do one squared. Some of the things that a lot of textbooks ask for uh, are stuff like, well, is it isosceles? Can you verify it is isosceles? Yes, no. Yes. 
Exactly. Is it a right triangle? Well, then you do things like, well, do two of these sides squared equal the hypotenuse squared? And it doesn't here. So no, it's not a, not a right triangle. But you, you talk about Pythagorean theorem. Um, if I said, are they collinear? Do two of them add up to a third one? Well, that would be collinear. If two lengths add up to the third one, you don't have a triangle anymore. You have the non-triangle. You just have three segments lying on top of each other. That, that's what happens here. Does that make sense to you? That's the idea, but it uses some of this stuff. Uh, midpoint formula is just an extrapolation as well. If I want to find the midpoint, this is midpoint for two points, or for, sorry, for a, a 2D system. It's just averaging the coordinates. And that's exactly the same thing we do for, for 3, for 3D. Now we talked about it briefly, but we're not going to have a whole lot of circles anymore. If we take the idea of circle from 2D, what shape do we get for, for 3D? Sphere. Yeah. yeah. So circles now change to... I love spheres. What's really awesome about spheres is everything you learn from circles pretty much works for spheres. Just like distance, just like midpoint, we just have this little addition, this little concept added onto it. This right here, please watch carefully, this right here would be the equation for a circle. This is it. All we have to do is add to it the third dimension. I forget what I use. L. L. The only thing that you really got to get down for like the center of a circle, it's always the opposite of whatever that sign is. So if this is a minus, the center is a positive number. If that's a plus, the center has a negative number in it. Does that make sense to you? It's as simple as I can make it. So our center for a sphere is very much like the center of a circle. We have H, we have K, and we're going to have L. The radius actually still works also. The radius is just R, which is nice. I want a quick head nod if you're okay with, with this so far. Are you sure? You want to try an example here real fast? All right. Let's go ahead and I'm going to give you a pretty nasty equation and we're going to see what this thing is. Anybody want to do that? You're like, no, no, yeah, that's it. No, dude, that's a lot. Uh, that's not a thing. That's a thing. Here's how to cope with with a lot of this stuff. Uh, number one, you're going to get pretty used to looking at a, an equation and giving me a surface that's associated with it. Trust me, you're going to get very good at that because a lot of things that we do in here deal with these surfaces. Uh, a lot of quadric surfaces that, that we have. Uh, so we'll talk about, about this thing, but, but here's some things that you can try to see if, if this thing is a, a circle or, I'm sorry, a sphere or, or a cylinder. Here, here's one of the concepts. Number one thing, if you have square, 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 same number here, no other squares, probably a sphere, all right? It's probably going to be some sort of a sphere or at least a quadrant surface. Um, in that case, when you have square, 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 same exact number, Let's go ahead and try to group our variables. Let's try to get no coefficients in front of those squares because we're going to try to complete the square. That's, that's the idea here. So let, let's, let's try to get a look at it. Let's move our constant. We're going to also group our variables. So when I talk about that, I mean, let's put our x's together. Let's put our y's together. Let's put our z's together. And let's get our constant off to the other side. Now, if you remember completing the square, I know this, this is kind of how I, I do review with you. Uh, I do problems that deal with some stuff that you should know. It's going to give you a little chance at review, all right? So if you know how to complete the square, that's awesome. If you don't know how to complete the square, the idea is you can't have numbers here. You can't have numbers here. This is why we look for the coefficients of our square terms to be the same, because we're going to divide those out. 
So we're going to divide everything by 2. I give you a nice problem. Divide everything by 2, and I also mean this side. So go ahead and do that now. I want to know if you, you made it that far. Give me a quick hit now if you, you made it that far. Cool. Do you remember how to complete the square? Yes. I'm going to do one of them, and you're responsible for the other ones, okay? Here's how you complete the square. What happens? You take this number, you take half of it, and you square it. So when I take half this number, it's negative 3 halves. I square that, I get positive 9 fourths. That's what gets added to both sides of your equation. It's got to be both sides or else you don't have an equation anymore. Okay? It's got to be both sides. I'll, let's do one more. This one. Let's half that number. Everybody, quickly please. Let's half that number. One. No, it's not one. It's negative, negative one. The sign matters for the next thing we do. It's negative one. When you square it, what's the square of negative one? One. one. So we're going to add that. It's always adding. Now we're going to add it to both sides. Can you do the last one, please? What's half that number? Come on, I can't hear you. What's, what's half that number? What's one half squared? One fourth. You're adding one fourth. Remember the advice about a fraction calculator? Remember that? Fraction. Get a fraction calculator. You don't want to. I guess it's not that hard, but I mean that sucks to have to think about all that stuff uh, right there. So, well, what? How much is it? So it's 10, ten fourths, that's 5 halves, so 6 halves is 3 plus 1, that's 4. Did you guys get 4? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good, okay. Fraction, fraction button, calculate, do it, man, you don't want to waste time. <laughs> so all this junk adds to 4. This side, here's how you finish completing the square if you don't know how to do it. It's really easy. You just have to remember the numbers that you've got before you squared them and the factoring's right there. Okay? So here, here, here's how it works. This part's going to give you something. This part's going to give you something. This part's going to give you something. This is x. Do you remember what half that number was? Yeah. Including the sign? Negative three And squared. Do you remember what half that number was? <coughs> Come on, folks, play along with me. Negative one. Minus one, and you square it. This is no fun if I, you can play tennis by yourself. Come on. It sucks. It's hitting a ball against some, like, walls right now. Goodness gracious. Uh, what's half of this? What's half that number? The one that you got? So z plus one half squared. Okay, I want to show if you feel okay with, with that idea. It's, I know it's just algebra, but the just algebra part can be really hard. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's usually what people end up screwing up in calculus is the algebra, and the graphene, the doing this junk. Hey, is that a sphere? Can you recognize the formula for a sphere? Yes. Okay, right now, I want you to write, and we're going to do it right up here. Can you write the center and the radius for that sphere? On your own, write the center and the radius for that sphere, please. You don't have to say it out loud, okay? Just do it on your own.
true or false, the first coordinate, the x coordinate of our center is going to be negative. True or false, it's going to be negative. False. Good. What's the x coordinate for our center? Yeah. It's always the opposite of that sign that's in there. That's the way the shifting works inside parentheses. That's like a translation that you learn from uh, intermediate algebra. What's the y coordinate, please, everybody? What's the z coordinate? You caught it. Perfect. Radius, come on, radius. 4, 16, 2, what is it? 2. Perfect. Could you graph it if I asked you to? Yes. Yeah, but not fine. Because even just finding the center itself is going to suck. And then doing the radius, that, that, that's not going to be so much fun. Computer? Yeah. Uh, but you can think about where it's at, and that's, that thing's going to be a sphere. Head and if you're okay on this one so far. This last one that we're going to do, just a little practice example to see how this stuff works. I'm going to mostly just give you the, the answers here. I just want you thinking through it right now. So let's think through this. Imagine a sphere, and at opposite ends of the diameter, I've got these two points A and B. Don't say it out loud. I want you to think about it. What would you do? I just spit. That was nasty. Sorry. Cut that on HD camera. The <laughs> Whatever. I'm not going to edit it either. Enjoy that. Uh, so, <laughs> I lost a train of thought now. Oh, yeah, right. So these two points are opposite ends of a diameter. Diameters always go through where? Seven. Diameters over the radius. Diameters go through the center. So, if I give you two points and say they're the opposite end of a diameter, how would you find the center? Halfway through. Oh, did we have a formula for the halfway through? The not distance. The midpoint. If you wanted to find out where the center is, the center, you should do this on your own when you go home to see if you do the same thing. The center would be at the midpoint of A and B. I've already done it. Uh, the midpoint would be, it's, it's really just averaging them. I mean, it's not that hard. Honestly, you'd probably do it right now. Five halves. Negative one half. Five halves. Did you catch how to do the midpoint really fast? Do you understand that the center would be the midpoint if that's the end of a day? It's the idea of putting this stuff in your head, right? Getting it, getting it, it's weird, but there's a lot of geometry. A lot. You got a picture. Oh, goodness. Um, could you tell me what the radius is? Could you tell me how to find the radius? Could you tell me that? Okay, I know that radius is half the diameter. That's very good. What's the diameter? The segment from here to here? Yeah, that's good. How would you find the distance? Yeah, if you did the distance and then did the distance between here and here would sure give you the distance of the diameter. How do you find the radius? So this would be one half the distance from A to B. The distance from A to B is okay, let's see, one squared, five squared, three squared, that's thirty-five. Get a square root and then take half of it. That right there would be the radius. Square root thirty five root two. I did it fast. You need to do it on your own when you get home. Just, just go through it. Just through it one time. Do the midpoint formula yourself. Do the distance formula yourself. Take half of it to understand that the radius is going to be that square root of 35 over 2. Are you guys okay with what I'm talking about? How about this one? If I give you the center, which is what this is, and the radius, can you write for me the equation of the circle? Try it. Try it. We just went from here to here. Try going from here to here on that example. Give you about a minute. Go for it. Write the equation for that. Oh, I know we got the good stuff. We got the favorite part of my day right here. It wasn't when I got kicked out of my own classroom, and it wasn't when uh, I ran my fifth wheel into an overpass. It wasn't that. That's not my... No, that wasn't today, though. It's still in my mind, though. I'm so heartbroken, just a little bit. It happened, for real. It sucked. Um, 
And somebody can talk about vectors in like half a second when you when you finish that. The way that the equation, I think I said circle, I meant sphere, if I misspoke. Um, the equation of the sphere always looks like this. Always looks like that. All you have to be able to do is figure out what the center is, put it in the right spots. It's kind of nice though, because x coordinates match up with x variable, y coordinates, y variable, Z, and the same stuff. And the radius doesn't change either. You gotta put the right things in the right spots, the right signs. Am I gonna have a plus or a minus right here? Minus. But very good. Plus, plus, minus. minus. If I leave that square there, yes. And then if I actually go ahead and square it, if you gave me this, then that's all. That's the correct answer also. You guys with me? Hard? Medium? Weird? Different, right? It's different. You get to wrap your head around it. You will. Trust me, you will. Now we're going to talk about vectors in three spaces. This is where we make our money, okay? So this is this is great. Um, this is not calculusy stuff. We we use it to get our, our head around what 3D is. Um, this stuff, this vectors in, in R3, in three space, in three dimensions. This is where we're going to make our money in our class, okay? Uh, this is what we deal with calculus with is a lot of vectors. So we're going to talk about vectors. The good part is that all the stuff I'm teaching you right now, I'm really not teaching you. I am just taking, just like this was an extension of 2D, this is an extension of 2D. It's virtually the same, okay? So we're gonna talk about position vectors, we're going to uh, figure out what magnitude is, we're gonna talk about unit vectors, we're gonna talk about parallel. Uh, we're not gonna have slope anymore, because slope doesn't work anymore. We don't, we're not just on a plane. We're crossing through planes and doing stuff like that. So it, it doesn't work. So it actually makes our lives easier. There's now only going to be one way to check for parallel vectors. Are you following what I'm talking about so far? So this, if you think of anything, it's an extension of 2D vectors, but we'll talk about it right now. So the first thing we need to know is how we define position vectors. But you know it, right? Come on. What's a position? What's a position vector? What's it? What's it do? Where does it start at? Zero. zero. Good. It starts at the origin. Zero. 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 Where's it go? Say it louder. You said to a. To a point. Goes to a point. So a position vector is this vector that has its initial point at the origin, and it points to a point. And where it point that point it points to are literally the components of that position vector. It's very convenient. It just says, hey. I'm I'm going from the origin to here. I'm pointing there. And same thing in 2D, we just now have for 3D. The thing I need you to know is a position vector is that the idea is the same. It starts, it initiates at the origin, and it terminates at whatever the point is that's denoted by our vector. Are right, you understanding the concept here? So it looks identical. That would be old school position vector. Yes? Now here's new one. It's, we just add a z component. And now instead of going on the xy plane, we now have xy motion and z motion gives us a 3D vector. Can you extrapolate from this and tell me maybe a different way to write without the, without the brackets? What do you think? What would the first thing be? The first thing would not be a First thing would be a number. It'd be the same exact number, but then what, what, what this is, is just different notation. This says this is the vector that's pointing to this point. Do you get the point? This one says that, hey, you're going this scalar times that i direction, you know, vector in the x direction. Then you're taking this in the j direction, and you're taking what letter you want to use now? Okay. You guys are geniuses, all of you. Okay, we'll do K. Yeah, K. Exactly right. And what these are, are the X and the Y and the Z components. 
X and the Y and the Z components. It's, it's the same thing as 2D, we just had that, that extra little thing. Now, if you remember talking about the distance formula, the distance formula was really similar to 2D, which means the distance formula for vectors. What do you call the distance formula for the distance of a vector? What do you call that? The magnitudes would be virtually identical, which is really nice. So if we wanted to find the magnitude of a vector, what do you think? What do you think you're gonna do? Come on, what do you think you're gonna do? Square root of square. Square them. Add them. Come on, do it. Square them. Add them. Square root. It's like infiltrate the dealers. Find the supplies. Oh. Well, maybe not that. But it's pretty close. It's like three things, all right? You're gonna square them. We're gonna do parentheses with that one. We're gonna square them. Yeah. We're going to add them. Square root. It is the distance formula. It just so happens that because a uh, position vector starts at 0, 0, we don't have that other, we don't, this is all 0, 0. So we're just squaring these numbers, adding them, and, and square rooting. That's how it works. Okay, the other two things, and then literally all we have to do is practice, uh, are these final two statements, which you already, you already basically know. Um, the first one. Because we don't have a slope concept in 3D right now, in order to do that, we have to restrict our direction, and, and that's called directional derivatives, and we are not there. That's like chapter 13, okay? So because we don't have a slope concept right now, we can't talk about vectors being parallel with their slopes. The only other thing was the second way to do it from 2D. Do you remember it? It was like 10 seconds ago, it was 10 minutes ago. 30 minutes? That was a while back. Uh, but do you remember it? Say what? Same unit vector, or maybe it's slightly easier. Remember the thing we did right, right down here where you did the whole factoring thing? Come on, put it together. They were, there was those things that we were multiplying vectors by. What are those called? Scalar. That's how you tell here. That's, the, that's how you tell. We use the unit vector. Please, please listen carefully, see there's a slight difference. We use the unit vector not to prove that vectors are parallel because that's pretty hard. We use the unit vector to give us a parallel vector to something else. That's what we use it for. Does that make sense? Yes. Shrink it and then grow it. That's what the unit vector does. It shrinks it and then we, we multiply to grow it. How we check whether vectors are parallel is literally just if they're scalar multiples. That's the only way that we really do in 3D. So vectors are par write that down please. Vectors are parallel if they are scalar multiples. If you want the real mathy way to write it, um, A is parallel to B if A is a scalar times B. That, that's the way that this looks. And we have done this already. Do you remember doing it? We took B, we factored out a number, we said it's, it's that number times, times A, or, or vice versa. Uh, we've already done it, so um, we're going to do that a couple more times with 3D, but that, that's basically it. Is that the math way of spelling it? It is the math way of spelling it. Is it real? Yeah, it's the bi well, if and only if? Yeah, it's an if and only if. It's a biconditional. So, yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not that bad at spelling. I know where it's good. Uh, but yeah, this is biconditional. It means that this is necessary and sufficient to prove this, and this is, ne is necessary and sufficient. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is good enough for this, this is good enough for that. So parallel means this is happening, this means parallel is happening. That's the difference. Can we practice? Yes. You literally have enough. I, I think, honestly, all of the rest of this is extra because it's just extrapolation. But we're going to practice anyway. So uh, what we're going to do is maybe mm, like five examples. We are going to move fast through them because they're very similar to 2D. Are you guys okay with that? Okay, so 
first thing I want to do is we're going to talk about parallel. Uh, even though we just discussed it, I'm going to show you how to, how to prove it. prove that vector A is parallel to vector B when B is the thing that I just gave you. Let's, let's prove that. Okay, come on, reiterate it for me. I know that we just talked about it, but I want you to, to get in your head here. Um, how would you show vectors are parallel? What do they need to be in order to be parallel? Scalar. Scalar. That's the easiest way. Scalar multiples. You can go down to the same unit vector, but it's too much work, okay? That's a lot of work. We typically do that to say, hey, I want a, parallel, a vector parallel to another one. Then you've got to find the unit vector. But if I just want to say if they're parallel, and I've given you two of them, well, then let's, let's factor. Factoring is finding a scalar multiple. So let's, let's factor. Can you factor that one? Yes. What? Well, I already did it for you. <laughs> It, are these two vectors parallel? Yes. Are you getting good at finding the notation here and here and, and translating back and forth? If you're not, and I give you a different notation, I'm going to do that a lot to get you used to it. Um, if you're not, then you go one step further and you go, okay, this is I minus 2J plus 5K, and this is 3, oh, oh, that's exactly what that is. That's 3 times A. And then we go, oh, this is what I'm talking about. If one vector is a scalar times another, they are parallel. With me? Yes, no, maybe? Easy, medium, hard? Yes. Kind of easy to do, right? You just got to remember that this is, is what it is. And that's one of the hard parts is remembering all this stuff, how to do it. Tell you what, why don't you try this one on your own. Here's number two. Let's let B be this vector. I think this one's easier actually. You can almost see it. Did you find out whether those two vectors are parallel or not? What do you think? Yes. Don't let fractions concern you. If you have a common denominator, that's always a good thing to factor out. Almost always a good thing to factor out. So if we have these thirds, let's factor out the one third. Then we get, what, what do you get? Thanks for whispering. I still hear, heard you because I get good ears, but yeah, all right, fantastic. If I factor the one third, we get one i. It's the i minus two j plus five k. If you get, if you factor something and you get your vector, your your checking for in there, and you have a number times that, you have something that is parallel. These two things are also parallel. Show of hands if you're okay with what, what that is for real. Okay. So this is also parallel. This we're just going to work with. Uh, what I want to do here is three things. I'm, I'm going to make you do it on your own right now because I think that you can. So I want to spend about two or three minutes. I'm going to give you that time. What I'd like you to do is find three things. Find 2a minus 3b. Hey, can you take what you learned in 2d vectors and apply it to that? We can still multiply scalars by things. We literally just did it. Okay, kind of undid multiplying. Uh, we can add and subtract vectors the same exact way. So I want you to figure out what this is. 
I want you to figure out what this is. And what this is. Do you know what to do in each case? Yeah. Not, not your head if you do know what to do in each case. Good. Okay. Go for it. Can you remind me to ask you a question about this one when we're done? This one. Remind me, because I'll forget, but remind me. Okay, so we got like three more examples and then we're, we're, we're done with this section. We just hammered, hammered through it. So uh, if you can hang on for me for three more examples and we're going we're gonna to be done with our section here. Were you, able to do, were you able to do the first one? Did I give you enough time for this? For the first one at least? Yeah. Were you able to do the, all of them? Okay, let me give you another, another minute or so. I want you to actually do them all on your own. I do want you to hang out with me till the last example uh, on, on this because it's going to be a re reiteration of the last example from section 11.1 uh, .1, and I, I want you guys to really hammer it into your head on how to do this. Okay, so stick with me till the last one on this. Goodness, two You know, a lot of times when we're switching formats or frankly just having a lot of small stuff going on in our, in our head, I don't know that I do that all at once in my head. If you can't, great, that's fine. I don't think I would though because I'd be like, man, that, that's a lot going on. I've got two different formats, so pick one that works for you. I don't care. I don't care. Well, I'll accept both answers, uh, I's, J's, K's, or brackets. I don't care. Uh, but be able to do it. So for me personally, I'd be like, okay, let's do 2a and see what it is. I know it's negative 2i plus 4j. That's my 2a right here. Does that make sense? Then I'm going to do a minus sign because I'm subtracting. And I'm just going to do 3b. Well, that's 6. Well, you can do the bracket notation if you like, vector brackets. But that's 6i, that's 9j, and that's minus 3k. Are you guys okay with that, for that first one? If you did brackets, that is absolutely fine. I don't care. Are we done? No, but we've, we've at least broken it down. So let's go ahead and finish up the last. This would be, how much? Could you go back to that? If you want to, or negative 8i, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do. 
How about the how about the J's? What about the K's? If you have negative eight i minus five j plus three k, that's that's exactly right. Also, is this straightforward enough for you? Yeah. Okay. What's the first course of action on this? What would you do? Multiply it. Then. Multiply what? The three. Okay. So for us, this is. Well, where am I? Yeah. This is literally just a 2D vector, so when I'm finding this, this was done in the last section. We can do it here, but it's, it's not going to be that hard. So we're going to have um, negative 3i three plus 6j, and then we're going to find the magnitude of that. What is that? Square root 45. You're going to see a lot of not square root 45 in the back of the book. What are you going to see? You're going to see 3 root 5 because they're going to simplify that. Are you making the little mistakes yet? Are you making little mistakes multiplying by the wrong number? It happens a lot. It happens to me, it happens to me a lot. I'll be honest. Um, I do it all the time. So that's why I take your time on these things. Last one. We find the magnitude of, oh goodness, negative 4. If you want to leave ve uh, vector bracket notation, that's fine. Negative 6 and positive 2. Okay, check my work on that one. Did you all get the same thing? Yes. And then finding the magnitude, I'm not going to do the work for you. What's, what's the magnitude of this? How much? Root 56. Root 56, okay. Two root fourteen. Yeah, because four divides that number. I think I asked you to remind me about something. Here's my, my question. If I took that negative away, would it affect that answer? No. All the negative does is reverse that direction, does not affect the magnitude. That's kind of interesting, right? It has no it's almost like the absolute value. Because it's a distance, it's a magnitude, it's a length. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, the last three examples we got. We got these two, one more, and then we're going we're gonna to call it good. Um, can you find, and they're, they're fast, so can you find a position vector between two points? It's done exactly the same way that we found position vectors yes. in section 11.1. How did we do it? I like the ch 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 but what's it mean? Come on, left-siders. Well, how do you do it? How do you do it? How would you find a vector going from here to here and have a position vector? Do you remember? If you do, awesome. If you're just kind of staring at the fish eyes, like, oh crap, don't make eye contact. You call, I'm not going to call on you. Um, if we wanted that vector, so if this thing equals vector v, you just subtract it. Just like in 2D, it works in 3D. So to find a position vector, we do, I'm going to write it all out for you, 1 minus 2. 4 minus 1, 5 minus 0. Position vectors, no matter whether you're in 2D or 3D, are just about subtracting the coordinates of those points. And then we automatically get a position vector. Is that clear enough for you guys? Subtract the coordinates of the points in the got. So here our vector would be negative 1, 3, 5. Could you write that as a standard basis vector? Do you know what that means? When I ask you to write it as a standard basis vector, could you do it? Yes. Yep. Okay. How would it be written? You don't need to do it. Just tell me. How would it be written? Negative i. 3j. 5k. Yep. That would be the other way to write that. Still okay? Could you find a... Could you find a unit vector for this if I asked you to? Yeah. That's a big deal in this class. We're going to find a ton of unit vectors. Can you find a unit vector here if I ask you to? Explain to me right side only, how do you find a unit vector? Unit vector equals the vector numbers on top over the absolute value of the vector on the bottom. Can you say that one more time but without using absolute value? Uh, Starts with the M, rhymes with magnitude. Right. Starts with the M, rhymes with magnitude. Good. That was a joke. Not a funny one, obviously. Goodness. 
unit vectors are found the exact same way no matter what you are doing. Okay, you take the original vector which I've given you, divide by the magnitude. Go ahead and try that now, would you please? Divide by the magnitude. Mm -hmm. That's how unit vectors always work. Look, if this is the length, of, as, you're, as you're working through it, if that's the length of your vector and you divide your vector by the length, you're basically taking length divided by length and get the same length and getting one. That's the definition of a unit vector. And I'll say this, when I say unit vector, what are we talking about? Okay, it does have length of one, but what are we talking direction. about? Direction. The direction. We're finding the direction that this vector is headed in. That's what we're doing. Okay, let's focus on this one for half a second, then we'll do that example, we'll end our section here today. So our unit vector, you got this negative i plus 3j minus k. Do I care if you switch that to the bracket notation? No. If you prefer that, do it, it's fine. But I do want to divide it by, man, you got to know how to find the magnitude or something like this. At this point, you got to know what that means, and I think that you all do. So let's find the magnitude, explain to me in the simplest way ever, uh, how you find the magnitude of a vector. What, what's the three things you do? Square, 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 square. Uh, all I heard was rub, But I'm imagining <laughs> that, you, that you said square him, Adam, square root. That's what you do. So underneath this square root, we're going to take, the, does, do the negatives matter? No. 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 We care. It's just one, one, nine, one. I hope I did it right. Square. No. Yeah, I, I end up squaring these in my head pretty much all the time. Because I go, okay, negative one, uh, it's one squared is one. Okay. Three squared is nine, one squared is one. I, I do that in my head a lot. We go, okay, this is negative i plus 3j minus k all over the square root of 11. This is not how you leave a unit vector. You choose one of two ways from, from here on out. One way is kind of sucky. One way is a lot nicer. You're going to see both ways, okay? One way that you can write the unit vector, make sure you have that little hat saying unit vector, you could rationalize and distribute all of this stuff, and you get negative square root 11 over 11i plus 3 root 11 over 11j minus square root 11 over 11k. That's kind of the messy way to do it, but it's the literal vector. So there's pros and cons, okay? This is the vector. It gives you each direction independently, and that's kind of nice. In some circumstances, we like this. <coughs> The other way to do it, take this, which is the thing that's taking your vector and shrinking it to a unit vector here. Take the thing, rationalize it, but leave it out in front of your vector. And this is kind of more an interpretive, uh, inter I almost said interpretive dance. It's like an interpretive dance of what's happening to the vector, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, what's happening is you're taking this vector and multiplying it by something that's shrinking it. This fraction is less than one. It's shortening that vector. And that's a kind of an interpretive way of, of looking at that. That's what's happening. Show hands if you understand what's happening. Good for you guys. It's fantastic. It, it doesn't matter if we change, leave that at like negative one, comma, three, comma. No, but with does vector not matter. Right? Either way. Either way. Okay, last one. I want you to recognize that this example is really similar to the last thing that we did in section 11.1. .1. Remember that? Give me a vector 
that is parallel. Uh, actually, I messed it up. Kind of give away the, the punchline here. Let's look at it. I'm going to answer questions at, at, at the very end here, but let, let's focus up, okay? I want you to find me a vector that has a, what's that mean? Magnitude. Or how do you think about magnitude? Length. Length of two. Magnitude, length, same thing. And V has the, okay, come on, right now. Same direction means same what? Unit vector. Same direction means same unit vector. This is when you have to find the unit vector. You understand what I'm talking about? If you're just checking whether two vectors are parallel, <coughs> scale them multiple. If I'm saying I want you to create from scratch a vector that is parallel, same direction, as another one, that's when you take this vector, you shrink it, unit vector, and then you grow it by multiplying. It's basically this, but then at the very end we're going to go, hey, you know what? You remember that one time when we took a magnitude and we like totally multiplied it by a unit vector and we got this? That's what we're doing. So, so basically when I ask you this problem on a test, and I say I want you to find me a vector with a, that magnitude in the same direction as this, what I'm asking you to do is find the direction. That's why I'm having you think unit vector's direction. Same direction, same unit vector. I want you to find me the unit vector and then give it the appropriate magnitude. That's what I want. Find me the unit vector, give it the appropriate magnitude. Direction, magnitude. That's what a vector is. It's a direction times a magnitude. I'm going to give you a minute. I'm going to wrap it up here really fast and then we're going to call it good for this section. Question. What do we do first? Unit vector. Shorten it. I love that. Unit vector is. That's the thing. Uh, how do you find a unit vector? That's like the big thing, right? You've got to find magnitude. So when we do magnitude, okay, and our unit vector, oops. Is equal to Man, goodness, you know what I see on tests a lot? I saw a lot. People take this and multiply by two and go, yay! You have found a parallel vector. It's the same direction, but it does not have the same magnitude. Does that make sense? So we're going to run through it quick, but the idea is you got to shorten it first. got to find the unit vector for the direction, then multiply by the two. So in our case, we got our i minus 2j plus 3k divided by, let's see, 9. Square root of 14? The magnitude of, of W is a square root of 14. How I would write it? Man, I, I seriously would do this. I like this because it saves me a lot of headache and a lot of writing the same thing three times. But you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can distribute that and that's, that's fine also. What is this? What is it? What is it? It's a unit vector. What's a unit vector mean? Come on, unit vector means direction. direction. That's what it means. You like the one, it's the direction. This is the direction that I want. Does that make sense? But it has a magnitude of what? No, this has a magnitude of one, because it's that, it's that unit vector. Let's give it the appropriate magnitude. So right now, we take our vector and go, okay, the appropriate magnitude that I want was what, please? The magnitude, sorry, the, uh, the unit vector that I have was this one. This is another good reason why you leave this hanging out front. Why? Simplify. It's a lot easier to simplify. And then if you have to, then you can redistribute it if, if, you, if you absolutely need to. But the vector that we're talking about, the vector that ends our section today, which is nice. Oops. Don't do that. Don't make little mistakes now, my goodness. That's 
That's money. You, you do that, you get 10 points on the test. Pretty, pretty easy. Is it hard to do? Do you have to understand every little thing about it to get it right, though? Yes. You absolutely do. And there's a lot to it. That's where we're going to intersection today.